Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread is, on its face, a movie about fashion, aging, and romance in the hands of a broken genius. It is obsessed with cycles, repetition in feeling and experience, a changing guard in a changing world and in a changing art form. There's a delicate nature to the narrative, where the director almost feels cautious to disturb what we see on the screen. But in a more subtle way, Phantom Thread is a movie about ghosts, not the kind that haunts the halls of a mansion or manifests in the body, but a quiet, viral possessor. These ghosts, invisible, unnoticed, but deeply entwined to the soul of the possessed, don't yearn for their corporeal days. They aren't clawing back into our world. They have no need for our lives. Instead, they just die die forever, dying forever. Reynolds Woodcock, the film's lead, is eccentric. He's arrogant to a childish fault, which he can't see through a veil of immense talent. Women, their figures, their essence are at the heart of his life, but distinctly as a medium to explore his craft. The female body, and perhaps her soul, are canvases by which he defines his worth. You have no breasts. 22. Yes, I know. 32 and a half. You can drop your arm now. I'm sorry. No, no, you're perfect. My job to give you some. But Woodcock, by his own admission, is cursed. A ghost wraps her tight, cold hands around his heart, refusing to let go, burrowing deep into his soul. It's the phantom of his mother, a woman whom he was born to please, that haunts him dearly. In his every move, in his deepest convictions, she's there, guiding him. I have an unsettled feeling, based on nothing I can put my finger on. Just butterflies. I've been having the strongest memories of Mama lately. Coming to me in my dreams, smelling her scent. The strongest sense that she's near us, reaching out towards us. Very much hope that she saw the dress tonight. His relationship to his sister is a perverse solution to this pain, a physical manifestation of the ethereal grasp. Woodcock has constructed his life in a way to hide from his demon. The aforementioned relationship with his sister reflects what he can no longer have with his mother, and, through his art, he can assume the role of a controlling entity. He dresses the rich, the royal, the adored. Only by his hand can they truly achieve beauty, something they so desperately crave. In this way, Woodcock gives others a sense of helplessness, the same one he carries along with him. A charm in his breast. A piece of his mother's hair gives him a false sense of control over the specter. He sews the suit. He locks her in the fabric. For a moment, she's under his spell. A phrase in his artistic speech. Where's yours? Your mother. She's here in the canvas. What do you mean? You can sew almost anything into the canvas of a coat. Secrets. Coins. Words. Little messages. When I was a boy, I started to hide things in the linings of the garments. Things that only I knew were there. And over my breast, I have a lock of my mother's hair. To keep her close to me always. She was quite a remarkable woman. She taught me my trade. So I tried to never be without her. When Woodcock was a child, he designed his mother's second wedding dress. He was given a chance, almost by God, to capture her beauty in fabric, to translate emotions into art, an appreciation felt only in the soul and unrealized with words, humanized a true love. For a moment, he controlled the obsession. What she wore 
how people saw her what made her everything he adored was his he made the world approve of her so she would approve of him in this moment he made her she was his canvas woodcock's futile attempt to conquer these feelings to restrain his desire would silently continue haunting him for the rest of his life like an apparition a cruel evil trick the dress itself disappears the one grounding entity in this obsessive relationship is no longer his just as his mother would pass and leave him alone in the sorrow so too would the manifestation of their love and where's the dress now i have no idea what happened to it no idea I most probably turned to ashes by now, fall into pieces. Perhaps the most pivotal moment in our ghost story happens towards the back half of the film. Woodcock finds a muse in Alma, but has, as to be expected, lost interest in his mannequin. No longer a mysterious beauty to be awakened, Woodcock begins to distance himself, just as he did with all the others. But Alma has her own curse. A simple waitress from the country, she's felt the warm light of Reynolds's gaze. She's nothing, and she knows it. But to Woodcock, to a husband, to a lover, she could be everything. Especially when he displays her for the world to see. Perhaps out of spite for the heartache he's caused her. Or perhaps because she's realized how little use she is to him. Alma incapacitates Woodcock by picking poison mushrooms from the forest and grinding them into his tea. In Woodcock's bedridden state, Alma undermines Cyril's paternal grasp on her brother and, in a moment of envy, tears his message from a Belgian princess's dress. A silent note, perhaps a jealous cry of pain from the haunted to a pure soul, never cursed. We come back to Woodcock, writhing in a pool of his own sweat, frozen in bed. As the score's strings pulse in sharp cries over a thick wail of pain, Woodcock finally sees her. Face to face, the music cries and Woodcock begins to speak. Are you here? Are you always here? I miss you. I think about you all the time. I hear your voice say my name when I dream. Then when I wake up, there are tears streaming down my face. I just miss you. It's as simple as that. I want to tell you everything. I don't understand what you're saying. I can't hear your voice. Alma enters, and we see the scene from Woodcock's point of view. His eyes follow her across the room, passing in front of the apparition that haunted him so deeply. The camera cuts back to Woodcock, and like an epiphany, the camera focuses our gaze back on Alma. The ghost is gone, and Alma stands in her place. The spirit has manifested. The love Woodcock feels for both are one and the same. Notice that the wedding dress he made for his mother distinctly exposes her breasts. Nourishing, maternal, and shamefully sexual. Love is a spell, a curse even, silently placed on one heart by another that burns throughout eternity. It guides the soul. When you're like Woodcock, 
when your life has taken the shape of your ghost presence, a spiritual presence. Every action becomes a message. Art has a soul audience. Dreams begin to feel shapeless. Every word is a painful scream to someone who doesn't even exist. She's not in the room with you, but you feel her. You'll always feel her. And you always will. Woodcock hasn't overcome his phantom. Instead, it is manifested in another body. Alma isn't the same as his mother. She doesn't provide the affection missing in his soul. Their relationship doesn't break the curse, but just provides a unified, perpetual exorcism. Both curses form the basis of their relationship. They couldn't be together without each other's horrible pain. Whatever you do, do it carefully. In taking care of Woodcock, Alma brings him to a reprieve from the loneliness. In needing Alma, Woodcock gives her life purpose. Like all great ghost stories, and certain love stories too, Phantom Thread is a movie about possession. Woodcock is cursed with the lingering memory of his mother, and Alma, having tasted the bliss of being desired, desires more. It's in the worst parts of themselves that the two find companionship. To live in the dream of happiness is to bask in a fantasy, but what is love if not a shared delusion? Johnny Greenwood's final track is a delightful waltz between ghosts, together in harmony, united by a life of sickness and pain. Alma is going to keep poisoning Woodcock because he desperately needs someone to save him. In public, they push a stroller through the park, design clothing, and dance in the hall. In private, they're slowly killing each other, but not out of malice. The film isn't interested in some objective marker of happiness, instead praising, delighting even, in a momentary reprieve felt by two punished souls. They aren't bonded by their appearance but by complimentary curses that they've been carrying throughout their entire lives. Invisible to the world, independently poisonous, but when manifested within each other, a phantom thread. Happy Halloween.